you can believe me or not believe me, but one thing that you know without me telling you, you don't know how to visualize anything in four dimensions. In four dimensions, it's only a big deal. Very smart people can, you know, because relativity, special relativity is four dimensions, so we are forced to think in four dimensions, but, you know, very smart people have some ideas. And lots of things are very counterintuitive once you move from two and three dimensions. For example, in the plane, line separates the world in two parts, but doesn't do anything in three dimensions, and so on. So, you know, understanding how these things work is uh, very amazing, and I'm telling you nonchalantly, well, just go jump into infinite dimensions, and, and here you are, you don't understand four. So how is this going to work? So it turns out we're incredibly lucky, and your human vision can actually propel you quite a bit in understanding interesting dynamical problems. It's rather new, like 10, 15 years ago we couldn't do what we can do now in this understanding and visualization. How do you do it? I mean, how do you look? How do you navigate 60,000 dimensions or even 40 dimensions? You know, anything larger than three. Here is a stupid way. I had u of x of t. Now I have u tilde, a vector, meaning a finite collection of numbers. And they're labeled u tilde 1, u tilde 2, u tilde 3. And they were obtained either Fourier way or Euler way. There was some discretization of original problem. Spectral methods, which is the Fourier way, are more intelligent than some problems, but you know, they are obtained in some way. And there is some set of them. And so what I will do, I'll take the first three. I take some initial point. So this is 60,000 number. I'm not throwing any numbers away. I'm just looking at the first three numbers. So they're just a visualization. It's not truncation. It's not modeling. It's not dimensional reduction. Just looking at a few of them. I will stick it in my integrator, my evolution law. And the integrator will produce some trajectory. And, and being either a graduate student or nonlinear scientist, I will never show any numbers on my plots. I will never tell you that this thing, actually, if I put ticks here, that this is actually of the size 10 to the minus 5. This is very weird because in the original problem, u was in some sense of order 1, or I could rescale my problem because there was a finite range of fluctuation. I could choose some scale in which u is of order 1. But your visualization is picking out, out of the sum, of 60,000 terms, it's picking out very, very small numbers. This is what the students will always do, but this is stupid. Think of it this way. Here is a soccer field. There is a goal, and here is the ball, and here is the player, here is another player, and what are you doing? You're standing here and looking at this. I mean, if you're a referee, this would be insane. You know, 60 meters away, the ball is moving, and I'm standing here and it's like this. You would never do that. You would do that. What you would do is you will walk over, put yourself as a referee there, and now look at the ball. Now when I look at it, you know, it's going to be a big ball moving here. There will be a big foot hitting it, etc. I'll know exactly what's going on. We can make this statement more precise, and, and I'll give it to you as an optional exercise, which you don't have to do, but it's a very good educational exercise. If I take a point in state space, And I take my first axis, so I take my unit vector. Then the component of this thing 
is given by the cosine of the angle here. In other words, the U2 component of my original state is some kind of product, which I'll write this way, but you can write it in index notation saying it's U2 times my state. And that, no matter what dimension is, can always be written as the magnitude of U, magnitude, and I'm assuming, assume, assume Euclidean space. Now, if you're fancy, you call this L2 norm. So magnitude of this, magnitude of that, times cosine theta, the angle in between. Another question you can ask yourself, if I'm in high dimension, I pick a point any place because, you know, I'm looking at chaotic turbulent system and as far as I know, every state is equally good. So I pick a point any place. What is this angle? So to estimate this, you learn how to compute volumes of high dimensional spheres. And what you're asking yourself is, how likely am I to be, in, if this is equator and this is my E, how likely I am to be in this strip, as opposed to how likely I am to be in the whole volume of the sphere. And that's a beautiful exercise. You use, use Sterling formula, you can do it even analytically. And what do you find? You find that the distribution of angles, so angles could be zero, they're parallel, to pi, the antiparallel, and it'll turn out that the distribution of the angles is peaked at pi over 2, and you can compute the variance, and the variance is 1 over the number of dimensions. Which means, if I am stupid and I just take any coordinate system, the thing I'm interested in will be orthogonal to it, because any two randomly picked vectors in a high dimensional space are orthogonal to each other with very good accuracy, with one over the dimension of the problem. So stupidity doesn't pay. I mean, you, you have to think how to actually look at stuff. Just going someplace and looking this way, everything will appear very small. And you start appreciating this if you actually start solving problems. You'll discover everything looks very weird or very small in high dimensions. <laughs> you don't see the stuff.